Hello, my name is Jeff Kinehart, and today I'm going to be talking about irrigation for new fruit and vegetable farmers. There are many different types of irrigation used for horticultural crops in Illinois. The familiar movable pipe seen in the upper left is still somewhat common, but has largely been replaced by other methods for most crops in Illinois. The wheel system seen in the bottom right is used for various crops, but probably most commonly would only be seen on sod farms in Illinois. Irrigation reels come in varying sizes. They can also come with or without a booster pump, depending on what your pressure is that you have coming into the system. The irrigation is on its own wheel and is drug out into the field while the reel cart remains stationary at the edge of the field. During the operation, the reel cart pulls the gun back across the field until it reaches the reel cart and hits the shutoff valve on the cart. One major advantage of this type of system is its portability. A few disadvantages are that it does require for you to leave an open alley for the gun to travel down. and high winds can affect the coverage pattern. Although that is true with most overhead systems, the gun is also subject to that. It is commonly used for sweet corn and in some other vegetable production areas as well. It may not be the best suited for particularly young transplants because of the large volume of water it throws, but it is very nice for use on sweet corn uh, and, and certain other crops. And here is one of the traveling irrigation guns being used at Champaign to water broccoli and cabbage transplants. The guns that they use at campus have a range of about 120 foot diameter. So six foot alleys are left unplanted every 120 feet for this type of watering. And although obviously that takes some production out of the field, the fact that you have irrigated acres, you're typically offset by the increased yield from the irrigation as opposed to the small amount of crop area you had to leave vacant for the irrigation wheel to travel on. This is a self-driven linear irrigation system and so instead of going around in a circle like a center pivot this one is more just goes straight across the field. This type of system is expensive but highly accurate since water comes out of suspended boom type nozzles, light wind is not a major problem with coverage. The linear system works excellent on sweet corn and snap beans. It is time consuming to move between fields. In some cases these rigs can be towed, in other cases they stay stationary, in the, not stationary, but remain in one field throughout the entire growing season. Micro sprinklers put on much lower volumes of water at much lower pressures than the previous overhead types of examples of irrigation that we have looked at. This allows growers to utilize smaller pipes and pumps as they only water areas that are crop adjacent rather than the entire field. There are some inherent efficiencies with these types of systems. Micro sprinklers might be used in a pot in pot nursery production area or in orchards water is supplied in these systems typically using small plastic pipes or sometimes referred to as tubes in some cases the pipes are solid and holes are punched in only where we desire to have irrigation present this type of system would be referred to as a point source emitter because we assign the points where the irrigation is going to occur at. In other cases, probably most common, the holes are already manufactured into the pipe at a fixed setting. For example, every 12 inches or every 18 inches there comes a hole in the pipe. This is referred to as line source emitters. So emitters are the holes and there's basically two types. There are point source where we put them in only where we want them and there are line source which come already manufactured in the tape when we roll it out.
Here are some of the materials used for point source irrigation. The picture in the bottom left is the tubing used to distribute the water down the row. The upper left is called a pressure compensating emitter. The red barbed end of the emitter is placed into the distribution pipe. The smaller diameter pipe in the bottom right hand corner attaches to the black end of the emitter on the one side and onto the spray stake seen in the upper right on the other side. The spray stake where the water emerges from is placed near the plant to be irrigated. Pressure compensating emitters are needed when the field being irrigated has more than 3% slope. If we fail to put in pressure compensating emitters with a field greater than 3% slope, the plants at the lower end of the field will receive much more water than those at the top end. Again, as long as the lay of the land is flat, pressure compensating emitters are not required, but if we start getting above three foot slope and have very long runs, then we need to consider purchasing these pressure compensating types of emitters. In Illinois, it is far more common to see vegetables irrigated than fruit, although we do see both. But in the vegetable system, which is the most common for irrigation, drip or sometimes called trickle irrigation systems are the most common for vegetable production. These systems, very similar to micro sprinklers, only apply small volumes of water to the area that is immediately crop adjacent. They are low pressure si systems operating at less than 15 psi and afford growers the ability to use smaller pumps and pipes when compared to overhead systems. This is a diagram showing kind of the components of a whole farm drip irrigation system layout and you can see we start with some sort of water source and then in many cases we may inject fertilizer we have a filtration system in place the water is then distributed out through mains and sub mains and then runs down the individual trickle lines or t-tapes to water the actual crop row itself For perennial crops, which some small fruit or Christmas trees may be irrigated, it is common that we would use much heavier piping, something like this particular product made by Netafin. This is a heavy duty line source emitter and we would see this on you know, grapes, you might see it on raspberries, you could see it on blueberries. Uh, this is very thick walled material and one of the advantages it has, it tends to have um, the ability to be very widely spaced. You can see you can go all the way up to 60 inches from emitter hole to emitter hole, which works out well for, again, uh, small fruit and Christmas tree plantings. Drip lines such as T-Tape, which is a brand name that you see being used here, are most commonly seen in vegetables in Illinois. This tried and proven system of irrigation works well and has become very widely adapted. It is suitable for anything from a small garden to very large 100 plus acre fields. As you see in the picture, field operations like spraying, training, or harvesting can actually be carried out while the crop is being irrigated. If you were needing to be in that field picking right now, there would be absolutely no problem harvesting those vegetables while you are actually irrigating at the exact same time. Um, another advantage is, is the area between the rows is not wetted. You know, if we have the weeds controlled in that alleyway, assuming that, you know, until it rains again, we don't have new weed pressures coming every time that we irrigate because that area remains dry, as you see in this picture. So what you're looking at in this particular photo is uh, the water here is being distributed through a type of material called lay flat that is being used for the main, and then it is being run down the individual rows uh, of tomato crop. So we're going to spend most of the rest of the time today talking about drip irrigation. There are many considerations for a drip irrigation system. First is what will be used for water source. Also we need to consider the overall design of the system. If you are not an engineer and do not have experience in designing, in designing or engineering irrigation systems, it is a good idea to work with an irrigation dealer, many of which provide design as part of their services. In many cases, when ex 
extension personnel go out on farm visits, we see failure to properly operate systems. Make sure that you do a good job of operating and maintaining your system once you have it in place. It makes very little sense to purchase a system and then not to utilize it to obtain the maximum return on investment and that is a fairly common problem seen throughout the Midwest. Each potential water source comes with concerns. Surface water, which would be something like, you know, a lake or a pond, we have concerns about contamination, the size of the structure of the impoundment, and the algae load. Well sources come with concerns over things like size and capacity, and particularly water quality issues like excessive iron or sand. Concerns with municipal water tend to be price and issues related to do we have enough volume and pressure to operate our system. Here's a picture so showing some of the potential problems with surface water that we can experience. The upper left picture shows strawberries that have atrazine injury from being irrigated from a pond that was surrounded by cornfields that have been treated with atrazine. Atrazine is fairly water soluble. When it rained, the water carrying atrazine washed into the pond. The grower picked up that pond water containing atrazine, pumped it back out onto his strawberry field and had atrazine issues in his strawberries. The upper right shows a strawberry plant with black root rot. And black root rot is a disease of strawberries that has various causal organisms including Pythium, Fusarium, and Phytophthora, all of which that can be harbored in ponds and lakes. And so pathogens are another potential contamination problem and not as bad equally for all crops, but for some crops this can be a concern. We also worry that the pond or lake, whatever the impoundment may be, must be of sufficient size to provide enough water even in the driest years. It does little good to have an irrigation system in place to accommodate you for a dry year if in fact during a dry year that particular impoundment doesn't contain enough water to get you through the entire growing season. Algae can be a very big problem on the surface water sources. It can plug up everything from pump inlets to the pumps themselves and even the emitters like you see in the bottom here uh, where that t-tape is no longer running the way it should instead it's running out uh, blue green algae slime and not watering properly dealing with algae and surface water calls for a multifaceted approach in most cases we are going to use inlet screens and that is important and we also need to keep the inlets elevated above the pond floor typically this is done by suspending that foot valve on some sort of a floating raft it could be made out of styrofoam it could be made out of PVC just some method of suspending the foot valve so that it is not sitting on the floor of the pond or the lake all surface water should be passed through a sand media filter before final distribution out through the trickle lines if we have a lot of algae problems, there are a few herbicides that can be used in irrigation ponds, but be very careful with your selection and make sure that you use it in a safe, legal manner in accordance with the label so that you do not have problems with that herbicide causing injury over on your crop. If we could avoid usage of herbicide in the irrigation pond, obviously that is ideal. I do want to point out that if you look, on these sand media filters, the small one that you see in the center of the picture is uh, something very similar to what you would see on a swimming pool, only there's two of them. In the bottom picture, it's basically the same concept, just a larger version. Notice that how these are always done in tandem, and the reason for that is this. The sand media filter works by dirty water is put on one side of the sand, and it the, de the debris accumulates on the top of the sand we have to back flush that filter periodically with clean water in order to have clean water for the back flushing cycle of the sand media filter 
we must have two sets of filters. Otherwise, we could not back flush. We would wind up having to back flush with dirty water, which would kind of defeat the entire purpose of putting this sand media filter in place to start with. So do bear in mind on surface water sources, sand media filters are great, and they typically are going to be run in tandem unless you have access to clean water from some other source for back flushing purposes. So that's a little bit about surface water problems. Now let's talk about well water problems. When using well water for irrigation, the considerations are going to be, you know, size and capacity. How many gallons a minute or gallons an hour can I do? And what is the total capacity for the season of this well going to be? We also worry about water quality in some areas, and this will vary from region of state to region of state, but even within a county, it will vary from well site to well site. Some sands, some wells wind up pulling up a lot of sand in the process of pumping, and we also have concerns over high iron content. Um, we need to address both of those if they're a problem. Some wells have such high iron content that they require treatment immediately before use. This is an, an example of an adapted Louisiana crawdad aerator being used in a pepper field in Illinois. Here you can see it running on that farm in Illinois. The water is oxygenated, which results in the iron being converted to an oxidized state where it can be precipitated and filtered out prior to being pumped out into the field where the trickle lines are at. If we were to just pick this up and pump it out in the field, that iron would become oxidized as it was going down the trickle lines and wind up plugging the emitters. Instead, what we do is oxidize it immediately, pull the precipitate out so that then when we pump it out through the trickle lines, there's nothing left to clog our emitters. Most farms will not require this extreme of a treatment measure but it is important to have irrigation water analyzed prior to using it so that we can have strategies in place to develop or deal with any water quality issues that might be present. It's important that we address the issues prior to having a problem because once you plug these emitters on these T-tapes, you tend to be kind of done for the season. Uh, it doesn't system doesn't work right the rest of the year. So rather than something corrective, we need to be on a preventive program in terms of water quality and its impact on irrigation. In some cases, growers, even when they come from a well water source like you see here, may still use sand media filters. Not all of them do. In fact, many of them don't, but there are cases where growers will do this. It is useful in dealing with small amounts of iron uh, and obviously can clean out any sand would wind up being accumulated on the top of the sand media filter. Wells that tend to pump a lot of sand along with the water can be addressed in most cases rather than with a sand media filter by using something like you see here called a cyclonic filter. These are designed to swirl the water as it passes through the filter and what winds up happening is the sand winds up settling out. Periodically, the valve is opened up at the bottom of the tank, and you simply remove the accumulated tank, uh, accumulated sand, reclose the valve, and and uh, they're very easy filters to maintain uh, if it's a situation that you're just trying to deal with excessive sand in the irrigation water. Again, those sand particles that they're allowed to carry out into the trickle lines wind up plugging them. Now, for a lot of small growers or beginning growers, it is relatively common that we would see them start out using a municipal water source. So let's discuss some of the problems associated with, um, you know, municipal water. And again, it's going to be mostly related to issues of volume of water available and operating pressures. Although municipal water may be expensive, the expenses of pumps and well digging and well digging and pond dredging can be avoided. 
If you are only going to use the system to apply water, then it can be normally done without any special concerns. However, many growers apply pesticides through the irrigation system, something known as chemigation, and even more apply fertilizer through the irrigation system, something known as fertigation. If chemigation or fertigation is practiced, growers must have an RPZ, which stands for Reduced Pressure Zone, backflow pre preventer installed after the meter and prior to the site of the introduction of chemicals. In some cases, a vacuum break may also be required depending on uh, one, the municipal system, the rules for the water company you're dealing with, and two, uh, some pesticides will require that you have that uh, vacuum break installed. You must check with your municipal water supplier to obtain the type of black backflow preventer they require. Additionally, it must be installed and inspected by someone from their approved vendor list of installers and inspectors. Failure to comply with these rules puts you at risk for significant fines even if nothing goes wrong and you just ca get caught. Failure to comply and something does go wrong will make you liable for the very least the replacement of all of your neighbors water meters and other equipment deemed necessary to be replaced in other words these situations when they go bad can quickly quickly escalate to hundreds of thousands of dollars of problems and even more than that so you cannot afford to not comply um, if you're going to be doing uh, fertigation or chemigation, you really need to have some mechanism of backflow preventer on hand. Talk with your local water district and find out what their rules and regulations are. Now, assuming that we've met those requirements so that we've got our backflow preventer in place, it's not a terribly big deal. The piece of equipment is going to be, I don't know, around a thousand dollars I would say by the time you get it installed for most applications um, again a small price to, to pay to alleviate you from hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of liability for failure to have one in place so assuming we've done that let's look at what other sorts of considerations we have for municipal water systems the first is that you know most residential settings have a three-quarter inch meter which is great you know you can take a shower you can run your dishwasher but it is normally not capable of delivering a high enough flow rate for even modest sized irrigation projects. As you can see in the chart above, switching from a three quarter to a one inch meter increases flow rate by 66%. It does not matter how well you design the rest of your system, if the meter cannot supply the required flow rate for the system, it will not ever work properly. Now let's look at design aspects or some other design aspects for drip irrigation systems. Just like meter size, the size of the pipe you use to deliver the water to the field is critically. Intuitively, I think one would believe that a half inch pipe would carry about half the amount of water that a one inch pipe would carry. However, as you can see from this chart, a half inch pipe will carry 6.8 gallons per minute, while a one inch pipe will carry 24 gallon per minute, which is nearly four times as much, assuming that we're operating at a standard temperature and pressure in both measurements. In pipes, even though the interior wall may look smooth, it has imperfections which result in turbulence. This turbulent flow pushes against the main laminar flow. The larger the pipe size, the higher the percentage of laminar flow, and so the flow rate increases dramatically. These rough edges that tend to kind of cause problems for water flow are particularly present inside of most garden hoses. So in general, garden hoses are not a really great way to deliver irrigation systems for very long or water for irrigation systems for very long distances.
as we continue to talk about design, let's look at how we decide how much water we will need to deliver so that we get all of our pumps or our meters and our pipes sized appropriately. Trickle tape comes in a variety of thicknesses, emitter spacings, and in some cases numerous flow rates depending on the on the vendor. In other cases you may only have a high and a low flow rate option depending on who's actually manufacturing the trickle tape that you're utilizing. There are multiple manufacturers of these. This is a picture of the particular brand called T-Tape. Uh, T-Tape or similar line source emitter drip tape is most commonly used. These products tend to be far superior to things like soaker hoses when we compare them for accuracy, consistency, and uniformity. I would guess most of you have been around a one of these black um, rubber type hoses that you know called soaker hoses that leak water. And the problem with them is if we had a hundred foot long hose and I go out here with four cake pans and put them underneath of that hose at four different spots. If I come back in 30 minutes, one of the cake pans would likely be overflowing. Uh, maybe a couple of them would be half full of water and one of them wouldn't have hardly anything in it. They were, tend to be very inconsistent in their foot to foot output of water. By going to a product like T-Tape or other manufactured trickle lines like we're talking about, the consistency is very, very good in terms of its foot to foot or hole to hole output it is very consistent. The tape that you buy typically is going to be stamped with a code that provides information about the tape. In this particular case, this company's coating gives you the interior diameter thickness, the emitter spacing, and flow rate so that if we know the flow rate, which it is giving us this, is 0.45 gallons per minute per 100 feet, 0.45 gallons per minute per 100 feet. Then if we had 20 100 foot long rows, we would be required to deliver 9 gallons per minute to the field. Going back to our previous information, we could find that this means that assuming water was not being used anywhere else in the system, we don't have somebody in the house taking a shower or doing the laundry, in this particular case, a three-quarter inch meter would in fact be sufficient and would meet the minimum requirement. We could also get by with probably three-quarter inch pipe size, assuming that we are not having to shove the water too far. If the field is located relatively close to the water supply, we're probably going to be just fine. If the field is quite some distance from our water supply or our water meter, then we may have to go with a slightly larger pipe size. The way the irrigation water distributes in the bed is dependent on soil factors. Coarse textured soils tend to wet up and down with less lateral movement like you see on the right. Very fine textured soils have very low infiltration rates and may be accompanied with the problem that water may run off of the bed because there is so much lateral movement and we have the bed itself only wetted just a few inches deep. Because of this, high flow tapes are most common on sand and low flow tapes are perhaps better suited for heavy clay soils. And my preference in high tunnels, which I know many of you are going to be using. When we go to the high tunnel with a raised bed, oftentimes inside of a box, I really prefer to see growers using two tapes, one on each side of the row, so that we have both good vertical and lateral movement and we get the entire bed itself wet, not just the surface or not just a small slice going up and down the bed, rather wetting the bed more in its entirety. Manufacturers will specify the operation or operating pressure for their tapes. 
commonly this is going to be somewhere in the 8 to 12, maybe even 15 PSI range. Growers should equip their system with some type of pressure regulating device to avoid excessive pressures. Failure to keep the PSI below 15 PSI will result in the tapes bursting or rupturing. How sophisticated this pressure regulating device is really varies on how complex your system is. It can be something quite honestly as simple as what you see in the upper left hand corner that screws on to the end of the spigot or the hydrant where you're going to be watering from. There's a little spring and a flap inside of there. As the pressure gets above 15 PSI, it won't let any more water through until that pressure drops and you just hook your irrigation system into it. In other cases, as you can see here, we have uh, diaphragm type regulating devices that are uh, more suitable for larger sized operations. But regardless, if it's a big or a small one, just make sure you have something in place to make sure our pressure doesn't get above 15 PSI. Next, let's talk about operation and maintenance of trickle irrigation systems. Emitter clogging, that is clogging of the little holes, can be a problem if the system was not well designed or we had a problem with filtration. Emitters can become clogged from several different things including physical debris such as sand or silt, also from biological agents like algae or blue-green algae or bacteria. Both physical and biological problems normally occur with insufficient infiltration has been undertaken on the part of the grower. They can actually occasionally happen even if we have a good filtration system in place. You know we've had a uh, an algae bloom that's occurred in the pond and has caused problems but normally if we have good filtration in place we tend to not have too many problems with this. Chemicals can also be a source of clogging emitters. Chemical problems can be reduced or avoided by having surface and well water sources tested prior to use so that you know what potential problems you're dealing with and also be sure to use proper water soluble fertilizers that are mixed in such a way that there are not any compatible compatibility issues with those fertilizers you know if we take Epsom salts and mix it with calcium um, chloride then we can wind up with some precipitation problems and there are other examples where mixing the wrong fertilizer materials together at the same time can result in emitters being clogged. It's not to say that we can't use both of those fertilizer materials. We could use both of them but we wouldn't use them on the same day at the exact same time. We would irrigate one, get it flushed out of the system and then irrigate subsequently with the second one. These are some of the various irrigation water parameters that can be analyzed and the risk associated with various potential results. There are a number of labs, A&L, Spectrum, Spectrum Analytical, and many others that you can take a sample of water from your pond, from your well, and send it to them and tell them you're going to use it for irrigation water and have them analyze it. This is different than when you walk into the local hardware store or lumber yard and they've got that rack where they give you a free water sample and you take a sample of your water and you put it in a vial. You put it in an envelope that they provide you that's postage paid and you mail it off to the lab and it comes back and tells you you need a water softener. This is not the same as that. Use a lab that's going to analyze for irrigation water parameters like you see listed here. Management of the system is by far the most common problem that I have seen in my career. You have spent all the money to have an irrigation system. It is there. It is in place. The money is expended. In order to get a maximum return on that investment, you've got to properly manage it. In the case of overhead irrigation with sprinklers, we commonly used to water once a week. 
with the trickle irrigation systems that are more prevalent now we typically water many times a week in most cases during the summertime we may be watering seven days a week and in some cases we may even be watering two times each day or even more how much water do we need to apply well that depends on a whole lot of different factors some of the factors that influence soil moisture include sun wind rain temperature relative humidity and crop removal obviously a newly set tomato transplant does not pull as much water as a mature fruiting vine since so many factors impact soil moisture levels growers must utilize some method of frequently monitoring and by that I mean once a day or more the soil moisture levels in the area adjacent to the crop driving by the field on the way home and seeing it through the vehicle glass does not constitute any real method of soil moisture monitoring the field method which is likely the most common is you know perhaps better than the drive-by method but perhaps not really the best method we could use and it involves feeling the soil to kind of divine what the level of soil moisture is although it's far superior to the drive method it's probably best used in conjunction with some other methods so in other words yeah I do think you're going to go out to the field with a soil probe and pull samples and see what does the soil moisture look like in the area adjacent to the crop in addition to that particular method we would also like to see you perhaps think about using some of the other methods listed above and of these and we'll go through them in just a second but of them measuring soil tension with a tensiometer is probably the most widely adapted by Illinois vegetable growers we have talked about the field method the neutron probe is you know interesting it's scientifically very accurate it's not overly widely adapted in terms of industry electrical resistance where we you know would bury boycus blocks to determine soil moisture levels is very common in some of the landscape and and particularly in the golf course trade but not overly common uh, for for fruit and vegetable growers measuring soil tension with something like a tensiometer is good there are new technologies where you know we can fly drones over the top and sort of look at changes in the color of green to see whether or not the crop is stressed as um, methods of determining uh, whether or not we need to irrigate and there are lots of old scheduling methods things like every day from National Weather Service weather stations they report something called pan data which talks about the amount of water that is evaporated out of a set size pan at the um, weather station itself that's used in conjunction with scheduling that is much 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 more common in large operations where we're talking about irrigating hundreds of acres using center pivot types of irrigations those types of schedulings are not normally done with small fruit and vegetable crops here is an example of what is most commonly done and and that is using tensiometers tensiometers are long tubes with a ceramic tip at one end and a vacuum gauge on the other the tube is opened up and filled with water then reclosed it's placed in the ground in accordance with the accompanying direction and basically it works quite simply as the soil dries water is pulled through the ceramic tip resulting on an increase in vacuum on that column of water inside the tensiometer which results in a corresponding increase on the vacuum gauge as the soil moisture increases through rainfall or irrigation water now passes from the soil back through the ceramic tip and up into the tube thus alleviating the tension on the tube and the gauge resulting in a decrease in the reading that we're seeing on our vacuum gauge and this is just a diagram showing you a tensiometer with readings of 15 and 59 centibars you know there's just it's a tube with a gauge on it that helps us determine uh, what our soil moisture tension levels are 
Tensiometers come in various lengths so that they can be placed at levels appropriate for the crop being monitored. This chart shows some of the recommended lengths for various crops and you know this can be overdone we don't need these everywhere at every length but they're awfully good to use in conjunction with the field method so that we feel a little bit more confident about our decisions of when to turn off and turn on the irrigation water when using a tensiometer a grower would look at the cinnabar reading and make irrigation decisions based on soil type Sandy soil requires irrigation to be turned on at a lower reading than loam soils because sandy soils cannot hold as much plant available water as loams. Growers develop a feeling for when to turn on irrigation in individual fields with the experience. Charts like this one provide a really great starting place, but then as you gain more experience, you're going to know this is where I need to turn my water on and this is where I need to turn it off. While large farms and golf courses may utilize computerized irrigation systems or even smartphone apps, again, not going to be something common for uh, beginning farmers and ranchers. Lastly, we just know that as you go along with this process, you're going to find leaks. They can come from hoeing or other kind of cultivating. They come from cricket moles. They come from voles, that little furry creature you see in the bottom right. They come from lots of different places. Make sure that you have yourself uh, an ample supply of these, which are slip lock connectors or splicers. Uh, make sure you get plenty of them. You will need them, but uh, the systems work great and they really, really increase crop yield when they are operated so as to maximize productivity on our irrigated acres. Like additional resources, there are numerous places that you can get them from. All of these are really good sites. I, in my opinion, the drip irrigation web links at Missouri has absolutely everything you might ever want to know uh, about drip irrigation systems. It's an excellent source, but all of them are uh, very, very good. So until next time, uh, this is Jeff Kindhart with Some Things Considered. Have a great day.